All right, welcome everyone. Uh, we're so excited to have uh, all of you transition with us as we switched from having this be in store to being virtual. Um, I know seeing some of the folks here that it means that those of you who don't live in Los Angeles are able to join us this evening, which is great. So welcome to all of you from Chevalier's, Los Angeles's oldest independent bookstore. Um, we are thrilled to have you here, and I've got just a few pieces of business before uh, we get to what this evening is all about. Uh, the first is that this is being recorded, so if uh, you don't wish to be seen, you can keep your video off. Um, there will be time for Q&A later in the evening, um, and again, if you uh, want to ask questions and, and not be visible or audible, you can put things in the chat. I'll be uh, sort of moderating the questions and bringing them to Marin and Jeff in that time. So just be aware of that. It also means that this will be available on our YouTube channel later. So for anybody who couldn't make it this evening or anybody who wants to watch it again, uh, you can watch it from the Chevalier's YouTube channel. Uh, let's see, the second uh, very important piece of business is that we have signed copies or will when Marin comes by to sign <laughs> in a couple of days. So if you want to get a copy or five, um, I think so far the biggest order has been for four, uh, you can do that. I'm going to put the link in the chat throughout the evening, but you are able to click on that and buy copies from Chevaliers. If you live in Los Angeles, you can pick it up in store. If you live elsewhere, we will ship it to you. Um, and then I mentioned the Q&A already. So uh, if things come up during the course of the conversation and you have a question right then, go ahead and put it in the chat. And when the time comes for the Q&A, I will see it there. Uh, and I will ask Marin and Jeff to answer that question. Um, I think that is it for my announcements. So I am very excited to introduce. I'm gonna I'm gonna start I'm gonna start with the star of the evening. I'm gonna start with Mirren Fader, Chevalier's regular, and <laughs> most importantly, author of tonight's book. There we go. Uh, Giannis about everyone's favorite Black Greek NBA champion. So we're so excited to have you, Marin. Marin is also, I should say, a writer for The Ringer um, because there's a lot that she does and a lot that she covers and writes about. And we're so excited to have joining her, fellow excellent writer on the topic of basketball, Jeff Perlman. He is the author of a number of books, uh, but perhaps you might know him best if you're an Angelino for writing Showtime about the Lakers. We've had the honor of hosting him before. Uh, and uh, I think we also had you for Three Ring Circus when that came out. And we are thrilled to continue to get to host him this evening. So thanks to both of you and thanks to all of you for joining us. Okay. Uh all right, well, first of all, I just want to say um, I've, I've been friends with Mirren for a long time, and I always think it's important whenever I'm talking about Mirren to give a quick backdrop, which is <laughs> I moved to California from New York seven years ago, and one day over Twitter, I get this DM from this annoying little writer from the <laughs> Register. Rude. And she's, she's like, uh, Mr. Perlman, do you think you could meet with me and talk about, write, you know, talk about writing or something? I'm like, all right, yeah, okay, sure. And she drives down. And she comes to a Starbucks near my uh, near my house in Orange County. So she drove from LA to Orange County, which takes commitment. And she had a notepad, a pen, and my book all marked up. <laughs> and it was a first for me. You know, you have writers that come along, or you've been a writer that comes along. And it really was a first for me. And Miran at the time, she was really just covering high schools for the Orange County Register. And she was driving long distances, and she was really, it wasn't that fun, but, there was something about her that was really unique, which is um, you get a lot of people come along and they say they want to be journalists. How can I work at Sports Illustrator? How can I work at ESPN immediately? And she was just always willing to do the work. 
she was always willing to do the work and she was always willing to bust her ass. And, and so sitting here now, six and a half years later and holding her book and hosting this is really a thrill, you know, like it's just because she did it the right way. She really has done it the right way. She really has. And, and one thing I want to say that I think is important to make to, to say about this book before I stop talking is um, you get a lot of books about young athletes in their primes and their quick hit books. So it's like when Kobe was 24, you'll see some book, Kobe, Star of the Future by some author or, you know, Shaq, or Shaq, the, the blah, blah, blah. And they're kind of crappy and there. Some publishing company will throw some money just to write a quick hit book. This book of a very young, about a very young NBA star is nuanced and detailed and full of imagery and just beautifully reported and beautifully written. And I feel like as I sit here today, you know, my my kid has all grown up and like Mirren is now, she, it just really gives me a thrill. So it's awesome to have you here. And I guess, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll lead in and ask you a question, Mirren, um, which is you were seven years ago, this kid at the Orange County Register who dreamed of writing a book and now here's this book and it's selling off the charts and it's doing really well and the reviews have been great. It's a basic question, but like kind of how do you feel about this on? How do you feel about this sort of fruition of a dream? I feel like I'm going to start crying and I got to keep it in check. We just started, um, but I just want to say thank you so much. I mean, the fact that you listened to my annoying self for seven years is quite the feat and I would not be here without you. And it's so funny because I've been to your events over the years, watching you and learning from you. And I feel like everything in my books, so much came from you. So I'm so grateful. It's been a whirlwind, Jeff. Like I, you know, the timing of this book with the book, with the Bucks winning the championship and it kind of thrust me, you know, into the spotlight a bit. And so I've just been like, so amazed at, you know, people holding up their books you know, I was always the nerdy person that loved books and nobody else really wanted to read, you know, book a week. That was me. That still is me. And then people on Twitter are like, I just got your book. I just got your book. You know, it just, it, it just touches me so much, you know, it's so cool. And, and to think like the register, you know, when I was covering Little League and you were like, it doesn't matter what you report, it's how you report. Right. And I never thought I would get the chance to write a book about a superstar. So but you told you told me this story on my podcast recently. You um you were at the Orange County Register, an editor called you in his office <laughs> and asked what you want to do. And you said, I want to be sort of a long form magazine type writer and I want to write a book. And I think you said whatever within the next whatever by 30 or whatever. Um and he laughed at you. Is that fair? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Very mean. Very mean, I mean dude. Wait, so <laughs> But I mean, I, I, I'm just kind of fascinated by this. Like how much is that, has that served as a motivator for you? Or is that just a, a bad memory that you've suppressed through the years? Yeah, no, it really did motivate me. You know, I mean, it was so embarrassing because I was really bouncy and, and bubbly and like, oh, I want to be a journalist and I want to do this. And he just like shut it down so quickly. And I think it's, it's very vulnerable to say to somebody, I want this big dream. And I think that that was, that was hard for me after that to, be as vocal about it but then I, instead of you know shutting down like he wanted me to I used it to to not shut down and um you know just I wanted to write a book whether this guy thought I could or not you know like I saw that was my dream that was the lane I wanted I didn't want to be a beat reporter I wanted to do the thing that nobody else really wanted to do you know the highlight was like covering football games on Friday night, taking your own stats. And I was like, oh my God, get me out of here, you know? And so I think for me, it just, it motivated me. It was like, no, I, I don't care if you think I can't do this. Like I want to do this. Like we're very similar in that regard. When somebody says we can't do something, we absolutely want to prove them wrong. Um, so yeah, that, that was part of it for me. So when you told me you were going to, you wanted to do a book on Giannis, um, I thought it was a bad idea. Yeah, Here's you why. did. I did. And I'll tell you why, because I thought, He's only 20 something years old. Like what kind of, what have you lived in 20 something years? You know, and like he has his whole, he barely played. I mean, he barely been in the NBA. He's not that long of an NBA player at this point. He's been around a while, but like, I just, I'm generally of the, of the opinion that writing a book about a 20 something year old, I didn't even understand life at 20. So how can a 20 year old, and you've proved me wrong a million times over. Um, and I am in, interested, like how did you actually come to the point where you decided 
this is the person who my first book should be about. Because I think, you know, for modern day superstars, it's very rare to be in a situation where with the, in the age of the internet, where everything is accessible and ev you think that there's everything you know about a person who's famous, we knew absolutely nothing about this guy's childhood. Like it, all we knew is he sold trinkets on the street. And I was just like, this is, first of all, this is a real missed opportunity from the NBA to highlight such a compelling person with this backstory. I felt like there just wasn't much information. And so even though he was young, he's lived like eight lives, you know? For me, the struggle was like, how do we not get to rookie year on page 300? You know, this could have been two books. I think because there was so much conflict and, and things earlier in his life, it made sense to me that it would still be compelling even if he's young. I also really like this idea of of covering a, a player in their prime while they're going through their prime, because as you know, most books are looking back and they're somebody who's retired and maybe their memories are, are different when they're looking back on it versus like catching somebody in the moment. And so, I don't know, I, I just found it really interesting and you wanna do something that nobody's done, right? And I feel like this guy was about to blow up and it just wasn't, there wasn't enough storytelling out there. But all right, but how did you know, like you're like all anyone knew was, you know, the basics and he, and he sold trinkets. How did you know that there would be a decent story behind that? Like maybe he sold trinkets and watched TV all day. Like what made you think there was more to it than just what we were seeing? I mean, I think because I knew that he was undocumented and the fact that, you know, he was born in Greece, but couldn't get papers because they don't offer citizenship as children of migrants, even if you're born there. And to me, I just thought this is a book about politics. This is a book about race. This is a book about class. This is a book about identity. You know, basketball is like the least interesting part of it. And for me, when I do long form stuff, you know, it has to be so much more than so and so is really good at basketball. And I just felt like there were so many political lenses through which I could tell this story, I, I just knew it had the life of a book. And I did a long form story, um, which is how this all came about on Giannis and his youngest brother, Alex. And I spent time in their home, you know, which is something no other reporter did. And just talking with the mom again, which is something she doesn't really do. I just felt like these are really genuine people. These are people that have really interesting stories. And I think it just deserve it's a family story and it just deserves to be a book wait what year was that when you went to their house that was 2019 and you yeah. were going there just to do a story on his younger brother right yeah so like serendipity Giannis is in the kitchen cutting fruit and I'm like oh my god you know there's Giannis and uh, I didn't think he was going to be there and then I, if he wasn't there maybe none of this happened you know wait so what was but what were they I'm kind of fascinated like what was that day like with the family with the mother and with the brother and with Giannis what were they like Oh my God. So the mom at first, so her name's Veronica and we're sitting in the Bucks facility. So we went to the house first and then we went to the Bucks facility and she's sitting like super far away from me on the, on the bench at first. And I know this is because she doesn't really talk to reporters and obviously I'm a total stranger, but I didn't ask anything about basketball. I just asked about like the kind of person Giannis is to his brothers and the human side, you know? And then like 30 minutes in, 40 minutes in, she scoots over and hands me an Altoid. And I was like, oh, I think it's gonna be okay. You know, I think there's a connection here. And um, she was the one that actually went up to Giannis and was like, talk to her. So that, you know, knowing it had like mom's approval, like meant so much. And their home was so interesting because it was like, he's just like a normal guy. Like I, my favorite part was I was doing the interview with Alex and it was like midway through a couple hours had gone by and we're in the basement and Giannis is upstairs and Alex gets a call and um, he's like talking in Greek. And then after that, I was like, who is that? And he's like, well, that was my brother. And I was like, which one, you know, because Giannis has um, four brothers and he was like, Giannis. And I was like, isn't he upstairs? And then he's like, yeah, he was just checking to see if I'm doing okay in my interview, which is adorable. And so I was just like, oh my God, this family. So that's when I was just like, again, it's not just Giannis's story. It's a family story. Wait, so you, you, um, you decide you love this family and you're also interested in writing a book. Um, I'm sure you had different ideas in your head. Like, were you were you pitching different ideas to your agent to see what he thought would go over well? Was this your idea from the beginning? And how receptive were people to it? Yeah, so um, at the beginning, you know, it was really hard to secure a literary agent 
um, as well as find the right idea because, you know, as you taught me, like the right idea is not just a good idea in terms of like content, but it has to actually be a sellable idea, right? So it's like this, this magic formula. And every idea I came up with was just like, not good. Like I would hear feedback from literary agents, like love the idea, not gonna sell. Um, I like you, but you're kind of young or like, I think you're on the rise, not quite good. You know, like it was just like a mix between like, didn't really find the right agent and my ideas weren't great. And I also was inexperienced, you know, I was quite young, I was 28. So I was quite young to propose a first book. And um, then I got introduced to a literary agent who is my literary agent now, Anthony Matero. And he was like, I'm keeping my door open. Um, if you have any ideas, let me know. And so I'd send him a couple of things. That was January, 2019. I sent him a couple of things. He was like, um, I don't think that'll sell well. Keep sending, I love your stuff. And he just really believed in me and was kind and took me seriously. And then when the Giannis story came out, I sent it to him and I was like, what do you think? He's like, this is, this is the one. Um, Cause Giannis won his first MVP right after the story dropped like a month later. Right. Um, wait, I just want to skip over something. Cause I, I cannot forget talking about this. All right, so I'm a person who had a book come out. I wrote a Barry Bonds biography that I worked on for two years and it came out maybe three weeks after another Barry Bonds biography. And that Barry Bonds biography was called Game of Shadows and went to number one on the New York Times bestseller list. And my Barry Bonds biography can be found at any dollar store you visit in the Bay Area. <laughs> I wrote a Roger Clemens biography that came out the same time as another Roger. Like the timing for those two books was brutal. You write this Giannis book, okay? It's one of my, it's, it's the craziest thing ever. You write this Giannis book. The Bucks are clearly not going to get out of the East because the Nets are better and the Sixers are better. And things just start happening, right? Things just start happening. It's the <laughs> craziest freaking, I've never seen book timing like this in my life. Um, I'm just kind of, and, and obviously the book comes out not shortly after the, the Bucks win the NBA title and Giannis goes on this crazy surge. And all of a sudden you're like the king of the world. Like, what was this all like for you as you're watching the playoffs and you know you have this book coming out and your guy is center stage? It was so surreal. You know, I think first of all, people are like, oh, did you write it like last week? I'm like, you don't know how books work. Um, this is complete luck. <laughs> this is complete serendipity. Um, I'm just watching him and I'm just like, could they actually win it? You know, like it started to become real. We were like, okay, if they get to the finals, like that's good for you. Everything was like in relation to your sales, right? Which is like not something I think about as we've talked about, like that's something I don't really, you know, know what to say about. But, you know, I think he was, he, what happened was people were not just falling in love with his play. People were falling in love with who he was as a person. It was almost like people were being introduced to him for the first time. When he said his quote about ego and humility, suddenly everyone was like, oh my God, like this Giannis guy, like he's so wise, like he's so smart. Like, and so for me, I'm like, oh my God, like there's never been more hunger to learn about the human side of this person and what are the forces that shaped him into being such a smart, charismatic, awesome dude. And so I was just like, wow, I really, you know, I lucked out here. Um, but again, everything was serendipitous. If Giannis wasn't in his home that day, this book doesn't exist. Um, it's funny, when I, when I said I was gonna do the book, um, I announced it on December 15th. Giannis said like 20 seconds later that he was staying in Milwaukee and people thought I knew and I did not know. And um, it was just total luck. <laughs> so it's just all these moments of luck and serendipity and um, yeah, it's crazy. Do you think, all right, do you think if you were doing a, I'm being serious about this. Do you think uh -oh. if you've been working on a Chris Paul biography and the Suns had won the NBA championship, the reaction would have been the same? No, Chris Paul is not <laughs> compelling in the way that Giannis is. It would have done, I think it could have done pretty well because he's just awesome. But like people, like the, the different, there's, there's, and I'm noticing this, in the different media that I'm doing, there's a crossover with Giannis. There is not a crossover with Chris Paul. There's a crossover in people that know nothing about sports, that enjoy Giannis, that are interested in immigration and politics and race and class and gender. 
there's people that are diehard basketball people. They think they are witnessing the current day Michael Jordan type thing. And they just watch somebody cement themselves in basketball immortality. Giannis has a crossover that few athletes have and that and they also just won the whole thing. And so the, the, the conflation of these factors is why I think it's different with Giannis. Don't you think there's also something like, I have now watched, if you guys haven't seen this, by the way, it's worth watching, the, the moment in the Olympics when the two high jumpers decided to share the gold and they do this hug and it's just the greatest thing ever. And it's, it's, Oh, I saw this. It was amazing. Yeah. Don't you think with Giannis, like he wins the NBA championship and there's a video of him that he took and he posted on Instagram of yeah. him. <laughs> In the Chick Fil A, in the Chick Fil A drive-through, like just ordering food, like there's something about. I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth. There's something about this guy, though. No. Yes, he's beloved. He is the most beloved player in the NBA. You just don't find that with any other player. People love him. He's just, he's the nicest guy. You know, I think it's again, people are falling in love with him as the person not like take a, basketball if, if I wrote a purely basketball biography on Giannis that would still be incredibly interesting he goes from unknown prospect lowest division in his country to MVP that's like fascinating enough but then you take all these things his flex of personality how lovable he is how sweet he is the way he is to his brothers the improbability of him taking this small market team to start him it's like there's just like a billion factors which obviously made the writing process really rough but um you know there's so many things that are interesting about him i just love like um one of my, my favorite stuff in the book for me personally is his almost like coming to america moments yeah I wrote um Giannis couldn't believe the bucks provided tables of food before and after practice Pla uh, platters of pasta energy bars chicken gatorade chips and then you put for free after everyone <laughs> speaking theirs he would fill up four or five plastic containers of the food to take home his teammates would look at him strangely, unsure why he was hoarding food. Like, be honest, it's ridiculous. Wait, so what? Is, I'm, I'm, I haven't even asked you this in our day to day interactions. Like, what was your, what is the moment from the book? What is the example from mm. the book that you consider the most sort of Giannis is just a decent human being sort of thing? Oh my gosh. Um, well, okay, the anecdote that comes to mind, it's sort of that, but it's also deeper than you know good person he is so used to not trusting people coming from the environment he came from in sepolia athens because he grows up undocumented and he knows that at any moment his parents could be deported to back to nigeria and so he learns to not trust people and talk to people so that rookie year when he's adjusting to america in milwaukee he um, is distrustful of the cable workers that are coming to install his um tv and so he asks that a Buck staffer is present for this. And so the Buck staffer comes and it takes up forever. It's from like nine to 4 p.m. The Bucks guy gets hungry. He goes into Giannis's pantry and he takes a couple Oreos out of the cookie jar, like really doesn't think anything of it. The next day, Giannis approaches him at practice and he's like, did you like take my Oreos? And he's, and he's like kind of pissed. And then the, the guy's like, um, you know, like he doesn't know what to say. And Giannis like, well, I noticed that three were missing. And the guy is like shook, like who does that? Especially a million dollar, you know, guy. And, and, and then it just occurs to him, like, of course, Giannis counts his Oreos. He's so used to having without. And I, I just think that that moment represents so much about him as a person and, and all that he went through because yes, he was discovering America for the first time. And we were all falling in love with how funny and sweet and cute he was you know like wow I love smoothies oh my gosh there's free pasta but like deep down it was really really hard to go from having so little to all of a sudden having so much do you think he um like the journey that he had in America the early days with the bucks was he all in on it or was he sort of walking a line where he was like I don't know if I'm going to be able to survive this I don't know if I'm going to be able to keep this up or is he just 100 percent in on the journey. It's weird because basketball Giannis was like, I can do this. There was this eerie confidence that he had, even though he was very scrawny and was not dominant at all. He would tell people like, I'm going to average 15 and 10 next year. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to make the rising stars team. I'm going to be the LeBron James of Greece. Like there was this confidence that he had, but he definitely was not all in, in the sense that at the time his family was still in Greece because 
So the only re- to backtrack, the only reason why Giannis was able to come to America and play in the NBA was because the Greek government at the last minute, like two months before he was drafted, realized that he had the ability to go to the NBA. And so they gave him citizenship papers, but they didn't give it to his parents and they didn't give it to his brothers. So they were trying to find visas to come temporarily stay in the U.S. with Giannis during his rookie year. And they got denied twice, according to my reporting. And so without them being in America, he was so lonely and so lost. And he told them, like, if you can't come over here, I'm going back to Greece. And he wasn't just saying that, like, he was very serious about it. So I think like on the basketball court, he was totally handling business and he believed in himself. But at the same time, without his family, he just didn't really know how to operate. Does he have mixed feelings about Greece itself? Yes. Um, I think that's one of the central tensions in the book. You know, there's so many things that are true. There were many kind white Greek people that helped him out when he was younger and they gave him food and they helped him. There were also a lot of racist people that did not treat him well, that shouted racist things at him. Um, Giannis grew up in the era of Golden Dawn, which is a neo-Nazi criminal organization that would chase and kill migrants. He was always acutely aware of this organization, which was not just some fringe group. I mean, it literally, they had seats in parliament. They were one of the largest political groups in the country. So he grows up being a black person in a majority white country without papers, and he is not treated well because of his skin color. At the same time, He is loved and respected by many people in Greece and and white people in Greece. Then he grows up, he becomes this national superstar. Greece is like, oh my God, you're Giannis, you're the Greek freak. He's a hero. And yet swastikas are still drawn on his murals. Right-wing politicians in Greece still say racist things about him. So no matter what he achieves, of course, he is not shielded from racism. So I think we can hold both of these things at one time is that Giannis is deeply proud to be from Greece and play for the national team and profess his love for his home country. And there were people in Greece then and now that still are racist towards him. And and both of those things are true. So you, um, you had a weird experience. We both had this experience where you've had to uh, report and write a book during a pandemic. And obviously like I'm working on a book where I needed to go to Alabama and I was able to go to Alabama (laughs) You were in a book where you needed to go to Greece. You were not able to go to Greece. Um, how frustrating was that? And what lengths did you go through to go to to sort of bridge the reporting gap of not being able to be on the ground knocking on doors? Oh my gosh, it was so incredibly frustrating. Um, as you know, life before the pandemic was like me getting on a plane every other week and you know writing setting wherever state I was in and. Um, you know, but writers write, right? Like you have to find a way. And the book was still due. And not only that, it was due in one year. And, you know, most people get like two years. I had one year. And so um, I hired a researcher in Sepolia to send me videos and photos of the streets and the stores. And, you know, I wanted to feel like I was walking the streets with this guy. And I made friends with a lot of Greek journalists. And I would ask them a million things like, what do you call the train stop that he got off at? What, what color is the train? What, you know, all these things like, Again, this is, I'm about to, you're going to hate this, but this is all the things that you taught me. Make the extra, I know you hate this so much and I'm just doing it. Um, Make the extra call, bust your ass, report relentlessly. You know, I would wake up at like 5 a.m. and I would start my first interviews at 6 a.m. over WhatsApp because I had free international calls and I would just interview people in Greece all day. And um, I, I had a translator, thank God, and that person helped me do numerous interviews. So I have never worked on something this hard ever. <laughs> Did you enjoy it? I, I always find it, I'm sure there are a decent number of writers who attend these. Like, do you, like being honest, like, did you enjoy writing a book or did you hate writing a book? Okay, I think it's a little more nuanced. I enjoyed a lot of parts of it. Like when I would talk with somebody for like four hours and I would get a really great anecdote or story and I would write it in my, I had an anecdote book and I would just put it in there to like celebrate my W's. Cause as you know, it's like, 
a very isolating, difficult experience. Like, I love that. Like, I was so happy doing that. Other times I was like, oh my God, this is so horrible. I'm never going to finish. This is, this sucks. We're all going to die in the pandemic. Like, it just seemed like this awful, like, cloud above my head. Um, but I really loved the experience overall now that it's done. Like, I definitely want to do this for the rest of my life. It's weird, right? Because, um, and we talked about this, like writing a book, people think if you're doing a book about Giannis or about an individual, it's about the individual, but then you end up really reporting 27 different books because yeah. you probably spent half your time reporting on Greek, Greek politics and another part of time reporting about Milwaukee Bucks history. And I like, so what was the, what was the segment, um, that had you the most uh, neurotic? Like what was the segment <laughs> of reporting? That had you the most neurotic while you were doing this? Um, so much neuroses, um, as you know. <laughs> um, I would say, I would say the racism section um, early in childhood, because not only that, but I chart how hesitant Giannis has been to talk about race, because he was essentially put in this impossible position. He needs the government to give him citizenship so he can go achieve his dreams. He can't really badmouth this place that just gave him papers. It's the, this neo-Nazi group is after him. He can't just be like, yeah, it was so hard for me growing up as a person of color. He was in this impossible situation trying to do his best to, to show how much he loved this country. And so striking that balance was like very difficult and very delicate. And I think also um, I was really neurotic about the trauma in his life. I don't personally like books that are just trauma, 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 trauma. Um, there's there's a lot of tough things he went through, but also he had a really happy childhood. Like there was so much joy and love and laughter. And so I was just very neurotic about like for every traumatic thing, there's gotta be joy. I wanna center both of those things and kind of have a balance. But um, as you know, I was on like a 20,000 a word uh, a month deadline. And so it was very hard to like, report and write at the same time to meet these deadlines versus like the way I know we both operate is like report everything first and then write. So it was hard to like know like where do I put these anecdotes if I don't even know what the next six chapters look like, you know? Right, I, I do wanna say like, so generally what happens when you get a book deal is um, they'll say, all right, you have two years to write this book and then you say goodbye, right? You literally say, goodbye. <laughs> yeah. do not talk to anyone for two years. You can, then you come back and you hand in this book two years later. And Miran said to me, I have this weird arrangement where <laughs> I have to hand in, wait, it's 20,000 words chunks, right? 20,000 words a chunks. A month, yeah. Which sounds Like three awful. chapters. Wait, that sounds yeah. absolutely brutal because again, like it goes against the sort of normal way of doing it. So how difficult was that? How'd you manage that? It was really hard because also like I've never done this before, you know, like I think, um, you put it best, like writing a book versus a long form, same language, different dialect. So I like obviously was not like, oh my God, what do I do? But it was like, I don't really know what I'm doing, you know, which is two different things. Um, and I think you just have to find that extra gear. Like you don't, even, well, you do know because you, you just gave up coffee, but I, the caffeine consumed during this pandemic was insane. Like I ran out of water. Like I had to keep replacing because I was just consuming that much. And I would just work at all hours of the day. And by the way, I had a full-time job formerly at Bleacher, now at Ringer, and then I changed jobs. So I was just I looked at work as my refuge, you know, social life obviously was non-existent. We couldn't see humans. So I just poured everything into my, my work and it, it gave me real joy, honestly, even though the 20,000 word thing was absolutely terrifying. Um, at first I just, I was like, I'm writing a book, you know, like, this is so cool. Like I, I love learning about Giannis. Wait, personal, uh, personal record, most cups of coffee in a day. What would that be? Five. That's horrible. That's bad. That's bad. It's not the health. That's bad. You're okay. You survived. Okay. I'm alive. Okay. Yeah. Um, Barely. I think you and I share this. I mean, you referenced it earlier, like writing a um, <laughs> my least favorite part of books. These books is the sports part. Like they actually are like my reading them and writing them. Like I, if I'm doing a book on an athlete or a team, the sports is the part I, when it's like, ah, oh, and then they beat the Celtics or then oh. he, you're like, uh, oh, can I just get past this and get to the interesting stuff? 
Um, you had a really interesting scenario. I've had similar scenarios where the Milwaukee Bucks basically, not only did they say, we're not really fans of you doing this book, we're actually going to tell people not to help you, yeah. uh, which I've never had before to that degree. Uh, I, I mean, what was that like? And how did that sort of impact your efforts? At first, I'm just like, you know, on the one hand, I get it. Your superstar player is in the middle of trying to figure out if he's going to stay or not in your city. Um, so you don't want anything that's going to come out that's defamatory. But on the other hand, I am not a clickbait salacious reporter. It's clear from my track record that I do like deeply human stories. This would be a positive book. Um, it's just incredibly frustrating. Like PR essentially have no power. They just do whatever, whatever agent wants. Um, and, you know, people don't really know the behind the scenes stuff about our business and the way that those things work. But, you know, I could sit there and complain all day. The days are ticking and I have one year to go. And, you know, I think it was just a day of feeling like really angry about it. And then I was like, all right, like, you don't want to help me, whatever, I'm going to get this book. And, you know, fortunately, I've been at this for some years, and I know a lot of people within the industry. And so I did talk to many Buck staffers, um, a lot, actually. Um, but I just did it without the PR team. And I'm sure that like, infuriated them. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a positive book about a lovely person. And um, you got to do what you got to do. If they don't want to help you, that's not your problem. This is what I like about the Mirren Fader story. Mirren, <laughs> an editor at the Orange County Register, who laughs at her dream, and she ends up in writing a book. And she has a team that not only won't help her, but um, you know, goes out of its way to kind of stand in the way of the book. And then this book comes out, and it's huge, and it's doing great. So that actually, it's like revenge of the Mirren. Revenge like, of the Mirren. Kill him with kindness. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> let me ask you this: What is your? Give me your absolute favorite. So. Enjoy it. We always talk in my house about nuggets, finding nuggets, little things, little things where you just want to go like, oh my God, guess what I just learned? What was your, what was your golden nugget moment? The best moment for you of learning something about Giannis or getting a piece of information while reporting this? Oh, Jeff. You can answer three. You can give us three if you want. Okay. 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 Not so the, not, not five, no, not no. 50, not no. 49, not 51. Okay. Um, I think Okay, one of my favorite, the funniest one, Giannis was really good friends with um, a kid growing up who is of Pakistani descent. And um, the kid is Muslim, Giannis is Christian. Giannis went to his church often to get food because the church had food for kids in need. And um, Giannis' friend was like, I can't go with you. Like I'm Muslim, they're not gonna let me in. And then Giannis was like, trust me, I got this. And so like Giannis, you know, 13 years old, goes to the church with his friend and he, the priest comes up to them and Giannis is like, hey, my friend here, like he's, he's poor like me. He's just having a rough time. He's such a good Christian, the best Christian, like, oh, what a good, what a good boy. This is my pal. And then the priest just looks at their friend is like, okay. And then, and then they get free food. And then Giannis um, looks at the friend and is like, see, I told you, bro, like you got to trust me. And um, it's just so cute. You know, like he's the same dude at age 13. Like he had that charismatic personality, that, that humor. Um, the other one is a bit more touching. Um, so like I said, everyone was really enamored by Giannis rookie year at how people called him adorable. Oh my God, look at this guy trying a smoothie for the first time. He's so cute. But underneath was like real pain and loneliness and sadness and wanting to go home. And I got a really great interview for a couple hours with this guy named Ross Geiger, who was like a real good friend of Giannis to this day, but they were definitely brothers back then. He was an assistant video coordinator with the Bucks. And um, there's one scene in particular where it's really late after a game and they go to Ross's apartment and Ross is like, okay, we have practice really early. See you later. And Giannis is like, wait, like, don't go. And then Ross is like, no, we have practice in the morning. And Giannis is like, can you stay the night? And it was just so like, Giannis, you know, like he was just really suffering. And I just think again, that vulnerability, I thought that moment was so huge. And, and that was one where he just like really trusted Ross. And I think lastly, my favorite one was Ross wanted to take him to an EDM concert and Giannis was like, okay, I have to ask my mom. 
he made a million dollars that year. <laughs> And he asked his mom and then he calls Ross and he's like, Ross, guess what? And then um, and then Ross is like, what? And then Giannis is like, we're going to the concert. My mom says it's okay. And um, again, just like the most adorable. And then they go and then they're all, Giannis is all dressed up. His boys are playing it cool. Giannis wears like fake glasses and everyone's like, wow, you own a pair of jeans, you know? And then everyone's shocked. He's so excited. In the car, Giannis is like on the way to the concert. He's like, Ross, man, like, this is big, bro. Like, this is big. And then Ross is like, what, that you're going to a concert? And then <laughs> Giannis is like, no, that my mom said I could go. Like, she trusts you, man. That's really big. And um, I just thought that was so cute. Do you at all, do you at all, all right. Do you at all worry that, yeah, you know, it's like you're, uh, it's like your kid, you have a baby and your baby's adorable. And then at 15, you know, he's like smoking cigarettes and hanging out with the wrong kid. Like, <laughs> you worry that Giannis at some point is going to get affected by just fame and America and the NBA and hype and everything of that nature. And do you think he has it at all? Do you see any change at all? I always get nervous. Um, profiling somebody that's why i never say like so and you know that awful cringe quote so and so is a great person but even better no so and so is a great player but even better person i'm just like oh my god cringe um i had a football player that i profiled at usc last year and he was just arrested um for domestic violence assault last week and i was just like wow this person is completely different than i thought um and that freaks you out you know but i think Giannis. 221 people I talked to, not one person had something negative to say. And every single person said he remains the exact same person. And I think it's because he never expected anything, right? Like he never was like, oh, they're lucky to have me. He's like, oh my God, I need to prove to this franchise I'm worthy, you know? And he, I think because he was so hesitant to spend money his entire career, that to me is why I think he's not gonna change. Like he didn't spend money on first class seats until 2017. Like that's insane for an NBA, not just an NBA player, a very long limbed NBA player being in coach is ridiculous. Um, so again, like you can't make that, like that's just who he is. And I, but again, I don't know the future. Maybe he does change, but I don't see it right now. Right. Um, it's funny. I, I, I've written about way too many athletes when I was a young writer and they would give you 20 minutes of kindness and you'd be fooled into thinking they're like super nice people just because you're young and stupid. <laughs> and something horrible happens and you're like, oh, I'm a sucker. So uh, you just never know. Um, Hopefully I'm not a sucker. No, I don't think you are. I don't think you are. <laughs> also the book was fair. I mean, the book is an honest book. It's not a, uh, right. it's not a kiss up to Yana. Exactly, um, exactly. Let me ask you, I guess, kind of lastly, like, um, you're now in the sort of whirlwind blender of book PR and we're doing a million interviews and blah, blah, blah. And we've talked about this a little that, and on the one hand, it's really hard. And on the other hand, it'd be horrible if it didn't exist. So what has it kind of been like for you as a first time author to be promoting a book and being out there and putting yourself out there? Yeah, it's scary. Um, you know, I'm not used to like being on TV and I'm not used to, you know, being the story. Like I, I love journalism because I don't want to be the story. I like being in the background and nobody knowing what I look like. And it's been like extremely vulnerable and like exposure therapy or shock therapy to just, all right, now we're doing another hit. Go out there, go out there. And um, so I, I think I've definitely trial by fire, but you know, I'm so aware that I'm so lucky. Um, we know so many authors that wish that people were calling them and wish that they had opportunities to sell books. And I'm incredibly privileged and I know that and I'm grateful for that. Um, you know, on the other hand, I it's hard because people aggregate things and put things out of context and it kind of puts you in a weird position as a reporter. And so that's hard as well. So I just feel like I want things to stop for like a millisecond so I can enjoy what just happened. Um, I feel like I haven't taken a, a pause for like a month because the playoffs really thrust me into the spotlight and I was promoting this essentially for like a month. So 
yeah, I'm just really looking forward to like taking some time for me and reflecting and like life calming down a little bit. <laughs> I mean, your mom is here, right? Your mom is watching this. I I believe so, but they mom does tell me to take. Tell, a yeah, I was gonna say says take a vacation. So yeah. I think I'm taking a vacation in September, but you know, it's like when I was at the OC register, you know, this editor was like, if you're gone for a week, we don't need you. You know, um, if you're working 40 hours a week, you're not working hard enough. Like our industry has so warped like hustle culture and work ethic. And it's really warped my sense of things like that. And so I, I'm learning now, you know, I'm 30, like I don't have it all figured out. Like I'm learning how to handle this and take breaks. Take it's just break. not something you do. And okay, take, vacation. Yeah, and don't just go to like Griffith Observatory for the day. <laughs> That's so basic. <laughs> um, wait, I want to ask you a last, last question that I'm fascinated by because I, I just love these stories. So here's the cover, right? And I actually love cover. the cover, but it's an interesting cover because you don't see his full face. And I'm fascinated, yeah. like, when you were going over this with the publishing company, was there, how much discussion was there about the cover? Were there different photos? How, even the title of the book, Giannis, was that always the title? Like how much back and forth was there, was there about that? Um, title was always the title. Um, I, at first I didn't, you know, it's funny. I love the cover now. I think it is so freaking beautiful with the blue. Right. At first, at first I really didn't like it because he, it was covering his face. And I thought that that was weird, but, um, but then, once I started reporting the book, there's this theme about eyes and eyesight, whether it was the priest that baptized him as a child and just always noticed Giannis's hopeful, optimistic looking eyes, or Giannis's first interview that, you know, many viewers have seen where he was 17 and, and this guy asked him like, what do you want to do with your life? And, he's, and he was looking up the whole time and he was like, I want to go to the NBA. There was this glimmer in his eye, again, this like hopeful eye and brightness. And then I looked back at this cover and I just, I fell in love with it because it just shows it's this optimistic, hopeful, bright eyed, always looking up, always looking for better towards the future. And it, it is a photo that captures his spirit. I think I, um, maybe I'm going too corny, but I really, I really do think it, it captures the essence that we were trying to do. I think whoever did that cover deserves a huge raise. I think it's one of the best covers. I it's think. so nice, right? Gorgeous. And, and the other three were like not, there were three of them. They were not comparable. I feel like I sent them to you. I feel like I, yeah. And they were just, they were just like very sportsy. That's the other thing. The other ones were like, you know, very like, you know, masculine, yeah. athletic, but that was just, again, this is not just a sports book. This is a, a book about a person. And that's why that cover does it such justice. I think. Yeah. It's very, very good. Um, I guess if we have other oh, questions, but I don't know if I'm handling the questions or if I, I will, I will help out with that. That way you don't have to try and keep your eye on the chat as well. Okay. Um, but our first question actually comes from the co-owner of Chevalier's, Bert Dykesler. Um, thanks everybody for being here, but uh, Mirren and Jeff, I so appreciate your taking time uh, to talk about this interesting, interesting topic. Um, so Mirren, I have to start by saying I'm a Jeff Perlman acolyte having read uh, you know, Showtime and Three Ring Circus and having had him at our store to talk about these things. And one of the things that um, is fair to take from Jeff's writing and uh, reporting is things are not always the way they seem to be. Um, well illustrated in Three Ring Circus, I think. There are these tensions and whose team is it and uh, who's in charge here. I wondered during the... Um, uh, tampering stuff that was going on or alleged to have been going on, uh, how the how Giannis's teammates reacted to the fact that he was supposedly going around the NBA looking to upgrade the talent as sort of a condition of his remaining in the small market of Milwaukee. Uh, I wondered if you heard any feedback about that from his from his teammates, either erstwhile or the ones who lasted? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know, to be honest with you, how they felt about that. I do think, though, that there's not the, the normal egos that you have with other teams. Like, they wanted to upgrade, too, even if it, you know, like, not necessarily to replace them, um, like you're talking about. But, yeah, I, 
that first of all, that time period was so embarrassing for the team. That's why I thought Giannis might leave just because it was such a bad look, you know, like, um, and clearly he wanted certain players and literally had a list of players, but I wish I knew more about the reactions of teammates. Thanks. Thank you, Bert. Uh, we have a question in the chat from Ashtar Hulos. Uh, I know, <laughs> uh, I know how much you love to read, and for me, looking at books I've read always transports me to memories of what was happening in my life at the time I read it. Did you read any books while writing this book that you'll forever associate with this time in your life? <sighs> Such a great question by one of the smartest women I know, um, my book bestie. What didn't we read? I she I don't know. You read like two hundred books. I read seventy books last year. I'm trying to think. Oh, I I know, Sigrid Nunez. Um, absolutely loved her book. What was it? What was it called? Um, the Fr the friend. Of course, it was called the friend, and it was called. And then the new one was What Are You Going Through? You know, when I was reading this, I became obsessed with the way that her narrator wrote and the narrator was like very um, present and active. And I just, I love the way she writes and leaps, the sentences just leap off the page. And I tried to really write like Sigrid. And it's funny because I was listening to a um, interview. It might've been with the LA Review of Books podcast, but Sigrid was on there and she was talking about writing during a pandemic and how hard that was. And Sigrid was like, writers write, you know, you find a way to get it done. Like, you know, people have written through centuries of war and famine and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, Sigrid, I was like ready to run through like a wall for you at that point. And I was just like, so inspired. So yeah, I think it would be Sigrid, right? Ashar? I think, yeah, I loved her. Great question. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Sorry guys, this is really cool. My, my friends and family are here. Well, I'm so glad that we had that question. Uh, okay, we've got another one that just came up. Um, this is from Y Wang. Can you talk about how the brothers, especially uh, Thonesis, feel about being overshadowed by Giannis despite their own accomplishments? Like there's always the narrative that the brothers are only getting opportunities because they're related to Giannis. How do they deal with that? Yeah, you know, at first it was really frustrating for Thanasis because like younger brother's dreams were essentially blooming before his. And, you know, I really like the metaphor that Thanasis told me about how he dealt with this was like his dad taught them patience and recognizing his own journey was different than Giannis's. He had to do it the hard way. He had to do it differently. And he he likened it, he saw this, you, the NASA saw this video on YouTube about cutting down a tree and how if you constantly stare at the tree and look at it not being cut down, you're going to get discouraged. But if you just keep your head down and keep hitting the tree, you're going to get to where you want to go. And for him, it was all about just focusing on hitting the tree and not thinking about how his brother was already achieving the dream and he wasn't um, because people didn't consider the NASA talented. Like he all the Greek agents and scouts I spoke to were like, he was definitely not a top tier person at all. The NBA people I talked to, they were like, yeah, the only reason he's here is because of Giannis, but he just kept believing in his own work ethic and his own abilities. And today he just resigned with them. And actually like, he really gave good energy genuinely. I, I mean, I think he proved that he belongs, you know, he's not just Giannis's brother. Um, I know Kostas, Kostas felt pressure for sure about um, being Giannis's brother. And it was really hard for him being on the G League team of the Lakers and trying to prove to him, prove that he was good in his own right. The, and the most interesting one is, is Alex. I think Alex is the only one of them in talking to me that expressed ambivalence about how can I achieve what my brother has. And I'm not sure I'm not sure if he has the same confidence that the rest of them have. And I know he feels the weight and the pressure the most um, being the fourth. So uh, genuinely overall, they are all very, very happy for each other and very, very proud of each other. You could not find a more loving, supportive family, but yeah, there's like so much pressure on Alex and Costas to make this happen. 
Thank you. Um, our next question is from Adam Lazarus. Can you talk about the challenges you go through in sports reporting in a male dominated industry? Oh gosh, do you have three hours? Um, I, you know, it's interesting because there's so many awesome men in the industry like Jeff that have helped me and, and given me so much. In fact, like to me, like all male journalists that I interact with are, are awesome. I think it's the, the agents and the handlers that I've had issues with, you know, they recognize that they have a position of power over you and they can sometimes act inappropriately and they know that you need them for access to the athlete. So that to me has been really frustrating and trying to deal with that while also being a young woman is hard and also just wanting people to respect me as just a journalist and not a woman journalist. Um, like I don't, like, I don't really like when people put me on lists of like top women. It's like, how can I just be a journalist? You know, like being a woman is obviously central to my identity, but I just want to be a, I just want to be known as a good writer. So, but I also think it has some advantages. Like when I go to a mom's house, like pre-pandemic to talk about her son, there's just a different energy there. And I think there's just an excitement that I've noticed when I show up at their doorstep, like I don't look like anyone that usually comes to go interview them. And I don't know, like I, I noticed that bond a bit. And so, yeah, I try to just not let the challenges get me down, but I've had, I've had some tough moments for sure. Thank you. Um, our next question is asking you to predict the future a little bit. Um, oh, this, one is, <laughs> uh, this one is from that. Ramon McLinn. Uh, will the paperback have a new chapter or epilogue about the finals slash playoffs run from this year? Yes, and it's due ASAP. Way to remind me. Um, yeah, I'm going to be having a lot of coffee over the next three weeks. It will. Nice. That is a, a tight turnaround. <laughs> Consider you've got to do all of your uh, pub date publicity right now. I know. I'm like, I have to write again. What do you mean? I'm done with this thing. I don't want to ever write. A no, we'll see. <laughs> uh, um, uh, let's see. Jordan Banks uh, would like to know more about Chris Middleton and Giannis's relationship since they've been together the whole time and his relationship with other players like Nate Walters too. <laughs> Nate. I love talking to Nate. Um, wow. Blast from the past. Nate was on the team uh, rookie year and um, yeah, he was, a, he was a great interview. He was really close to Giannis that first year. Chris, Chris and Giannis relationship is very interesting. Very, Chris was the star of the team, right? Like I don't think people realize that at the time Chris was the best player on the team, not Giannis early on. Um, and there's one flash moment in the book where Jason Kidd, the coach at the time, asks, who's the best player on the team? And it's this critical moment where Kidd is playing this mind game to make Giannis say, I'm the best player, because Giannis wants to be the alpha. But clearly, Chris is averaging the most points, most assists, whatever. And um, and then Jason like kind of takes everyone make take the bait and he's like well Chris is averaging the most points and who thinks Chris is the best player and then players just like raise their hand Giannis doesn't raise his hand it's a really serious moment of um you know I am the best and they're like why didn't you raise your hand and um Giannis said because I'm the best and I think that was like oh my god it's the most un Giannis thing and you know, they really became close friends after that, though, because both of them became so integral to the success of the team. And Giannis is so um, in awe of Chris in so many ways, because Chris was there when they won 15 games. And Chris has had a longevity in this league and a lasting power, even though he doesn't get the credit. Um, he played wonderfully so many times in the playoffs. And so I think like their relationship has really evolved from this kind of like competitive, who's the best to like, no, I need you. Like I rely on you, even if I'm the franchise player. Um, I have a question here from Miriam, um, and I, I hope that the answer to this is yes. Um, did you listen to Greek music and eat Greek food while <laughs> writing books, especially since you couldn't actually go to Greece? You know, I did not, but um, that's a real miss by me. Um, you know, that's a, that's a real miss. I will tell you, I worked 
hours with a Greek speech coach to record the audiobook. And I have learned so much about Greek pronunciation. And you won't even believe like the number of times that I re-recorded, re-recorded to get the accents right. Um, I mean, I really felt like immersed in Greek language, but um, yeah, Can you give us an example. Like the Golden Dawn leader's name is so hard. Nicholas Michaliakos and Michalis Kambarivis. Does that sound passable, guys? Okay, I'm getting some thumbs up. Great, okay. Um, got that <laughs> complicated high in the middle of a word. We go to Hebrew school though. Did it. it was, it's like kind of Jewish, but it's Greek. I don't know, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> Um, I think we have time for another question. If anybody else has questions, we've reached the end of what's in the chat. I'm going to put the link in the uh, chat one more time for folks to be able to buy signed copies of Giannis. Um, but if no one else has any other questions, um, I will... Uh, let oh 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 here's one here's one also from ashtar which now seeing the content makes perfect sense um she would like to know what are you reading right now i'm reading fox and i is it called fox and i by Catherine um raven is that is that ringing a bell um this this book is so interesting it's about it's a memoir of a woman who um is like a biology professor who lives in a forest and befriends a fox i'm telling you i know it sounds whack but it's amazing it's like a book about loneliness and humanity and life and something about woman in a forest alone just you know i'm not in a forest but i feel it you know it's just very i'm loving it it's a great book nice um, and if anybody else wants to read it, we have copies at Chevalier's right now. Did I get the title right? Is it Fox and I? Yeah. Yeah. yeah Fox and I. Yeah. Okay. It's, okay. Um, yeah. It's, it's a lovely looking book too. Um, and we have a question from John Paul. Is there someone you would like to do a book about after you, you know, turn in this last chapter on Giannis? This is something Jeff and I were just talking about recently. I definitely want to do a second book. I don't know who to do the book on. I'm like debating, do I want to do another current day guy and go through all the hoops and challenges with that? Or do I do a retired person, which is going to be much easier? Easy. So, well, like, I mean, I mean, first of all, there's like more, I know you, I, I know, I know you, I know you operate. The disrespect. It's the disrespect. I'm just saying there's more to work with. There's more material you know and then also you don't have to deal with like team pr which is like so awful yeah anyways anyone have ideas send it to me mirrorandfader at gmail.com <laughs> thanks <laughs> well um thank you to uh all of you in the audience for joining us this evening. Um, I hope you had a great time getting to hear Jeff and Mirren talking about her work and her process and um, yeah, just developing an even stronger affection for Giannis during the course of this evening, as I know I did. Um, and from Chevaliers, we thank you so much, Jeff and Mirren, for being with us tonight um, from the comfort of your own homes. Uh, thank you to everyone. And again, um, if you want signed copies, you know where to get them. Here, I made it easy. The link is right there. Uh, <laughs> um, we, are, we are so excited to be able to uh, do that for those of you in attendance. Um, in the United States, as I see a note here about the shipping costs to the Philippines. But uh, thank you all again. This will be up on our YouTube channel soon. Um, and for those of you who are local to us, we hope to see you at Chevaliers in person soon. Have a great night. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs>